Every weekday morning, I make my way to the tunnel level of the Winship Cancer Institute building on the Clifton Road campus of Emory University Hospital. At 9.15, the members of the radiation oncology team, nurses, doctors, techs, medical assistants, dosimetrists, patient care coordinators, and me, the chaplain, gather in a daily huddle to talk through the number of patients under treatment, what the team has ahead of them for the day, any specific needs or announcements, and special recognition or kudos for team members. Earlier this week, as I walked into radiation, I was surprised and delighted to see a large rainbow flag hanging outside one of the treatment bays. It is Pride Month, after all. In the midst of everything, in the midst of COVID and uprisings and personal and collective suffering, there remains joy and pride of personhood and identity and love as so powerfully demonstrated by our siblings in beloveds in the L lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer community through the celebration of pride in the month of June. How nice of the radiation team to hang a rainbow flag in support of the LGBTQ community, I thought, as I rounded the corner to the hallway where the huddle occurs. So imagine my surprise when I found team members gathered there decked out in rainbow garb. Feather boas and headbands, bandanas, rainbow sequins adorning their masks, rainbow stickers and t-shirts, bracelets and necklaces, and even rainbow shoes. I smiled big under my mask and really, truly felt a sense of joy that had been elusive during the two weeks since I had returned to work from my maternity leave. A couple hours later, I encountered one of the team members prepping for folks to take a pride photo to capture everyone's rainbow fabulousness. She had printed out signs with the rainbow flag for people to hold, complete with the transgender addition to that flag, light pink and blue and white stripes. It's so wonderful that you all are doing this, I said to her. We're here to support our team, she said matter-of-factly. We are here to love everyone. A couple of weeks ago, she said we had a Black Lives Matter gathering. This week, we're doing Pride. We want everyone to feel supported and loved. I do not know who on the team is a member of the LGBTQ community. I have learned that one cannot make any assumptions about people's lives or identities. I do know that the love and respect and care that members of that radiation team have for one another is as profound as one finds in any congregation, and that the team embraces differences of race and class, gender, sexual orientation, nationality, and ability in ways that are inspiring and instructive for the rest of us. They are committed to supporting one another in the fullness of their being, the collective is strengthened by the individual identities of each team member, and the individuals are strengthened by being part of the collective. Now, I am guessing that not every member of the team was as equally jazzed about celebrating pride. I am certain that not all of our patients were thrilled to see their radiation team supporting those, sporting those rainbows. I am sure that there were divergent opinions about the Black Lives Matter action when team members knelt for eight minutes and 46 seconds in the hallway to recognize the brutality and cruelty of George Floyd's murder at the hands of police and to commit themselves publicly to seeking and creating justice for black and brown people in this nation. And the thing is, it didn't matter what anyone else thought. The celebration and support of team members who are people of color and LGBTQ people, their comfort, their inclusion was more important than anyone else's discomfort. As I tuned in to various events during the first ever completely virtual annual meeting of our denomination, the Unitarian Universalist Association's General Assembly this week, I've witnessed Unitarian Universalists all around the country and the world wrestling with these very questions. How do we balance the needs of the individual with the needs of the collective? 
How do we make space for divergent experiences while amplifying voices that for far too long have been silenced in our communities and in the wider society? And is it possible for those of us who have long been at the center of the way the world works to tolerate our discomfort as the status quo shifts and the centers of our religious and cultural landscapes begin to move and change such that we might feel out of place. Can we remember that widening the circle of love and justice ultimately allows more space, more grace, and enables us to live into the promise and to be the people individually and collectively that we want to be? This is one of the most powerful and profound aspects of our faith tradition, I think, this wrestling, this asking these questions of ourselves and each other, this living into the messiness of democratic, liberal, religious community where we find ourselves under a big tent. And still we wonder sometimes if we will all fit, making room for each other, growing and changing in a constantly transforming world. We call Unitarian Universalism a living tradition. Each year at General Assembly, the association recognizes the milestones of those serving as religious professionals in our movement in the service of the living tradition. New ministers and retiring ones, newly credentialed religious educators and musicians, those ministers that have died during the past year. Each year, we are reminded that the names and faces of leaders in our community will change, but that our collective commitment to truth and justice is unwavering. The tradition lives on, though each of us as individuals will not. This congregation, UUCA, has a rich history of denominational involvement Leaders like Dr. Tony Stringer, who served for 12 years on the Unitarian Universalist Association's Ministerial Fellowship Committee, supporting and credentialing ministers to serve in our congregations and in the community. Nancy Bartlett and Lynn Conley and others who have served on the UUA Board of Trustees. This year, UUA staff members are influential at the national level with Ayanna Coffey Stringer serving as the president of DRUM, diverse and revolutionary multicultural, Unitarian Universalist Multicultural Ministries, the People of Color Ministry, and anti-racist collaborative of our faith. Nicole Presley is serving as the campaign manager for UU The Vote, the UUA's Get Out The Vote initiative, which resulted in thousands of calls made by Unitarian Universalists to 2020 voters just over the past few days, and much, much good work lies ahead there. Nicole also serves on the steering committee of DRUM. Beck Shalizzi was also in leadership at this year's GA as a presenter on the phone banking effort. Deep gratitude to all these leaders for the hard work they have put and are putting in as they served and are serving our living tradition. This year, I watched the service of the living tradition with my six-year-old daughter. And as the names and photos of deceased ministers flashed across the computer screen, I looked at her. And I wondered how old she will be when someone from the Unitarian Universalist Association will call her and her sister and ask them for a photo of me and how to spell my name. I wondered with whom they will experience that service when it is my turn to be remembered, with each other with their spouses, with my grandchildren. The image wasn't morbid, it was comforting. It reminded me that we are members of a larger village, a faithful village of dedicated souls working to love each other and love the world as best we can. Whether or not my daughters choose to remain Unitarian Universalists, and I truly hope they do, there will be a community of hearts to join with them in grieving and remembering me when I am gone. That faithful village will hold me and hold them in love and in light. We will join the long line of ancestors and the tradition will live on. What a blessing that is. 
In 2018, the Reverend Dr. Sophia Betancourt, then one of the co-presidents of our association, spoke at the service of the living tradition. 2018 was a year of change and conflict and pain in our denomination. It was a difficult year for many. Here's what Reverend Dr. Betancourt said then, and I believe her words ring deeply true this year. We are on a journey toward redemption, she said. We have lived a year filled with lamentation, with the strength of generations, the failures of the everyday, and the deep down gritty messiness that is the promise of our salvation. There is inherent goodness that exists between and among us, she said. I want to honor the weary, ragged miracle that is our living tradition. I want to honor the weary, ragged miracle that is our living tradition. Think about it. Think about all the times living in a family is difficult. About the family conflicts you've experienced, the pain family members have caused each other over differences of opinion or miscommunication or real harm done to one another. Then move out a little further and think about larger communities you may have experienced over the years, perhaps the neighborhood or congregation you grew up in, perhaps this congregation, UUCA. Perhaps you are visiting us today from another community. Think about the messiness of living in these beloved communities and the difficulty of living together into the promise of a shared vision and mission. Think about the strong personalities in those communities, about those also who are too often overlooked and underheard. Now magnify that and think about a multitude of congregations coming together, a plethora of communities filled with free thinkers and independent-minded doers. Think about generations of these people and communities making their way forward, following their hearts the best way they know how, imagining and dreaming and seeking to create a better world. Generation after generation, learning anew, changing and adapting as they receive new information, attempting to do better when they know better, remaking themselves, their collective and their communities in the image of divine love, ever expanding, ever widening, ever deepening. This is the weary, ragged miracle that is our living tradition. Each congregation in our association has its own story, its own history of being made and reshaped and reimagined. And our village, your village, is wider than the individual community that is any single congregation. When we hitch our wagons to a living tradition like Unitarian Universalism, we are made part of making and shaping and imagining what that tradition is and what it will be. And that tradition helps to make and shape and imagine us into being as well. I have always said it takes a village to make a minister. The Unitarian Universalist Association was that village for me. I was 23 when I showed up on the doorstep of the UUA's Washington Office for Advocacy, reporting for duty as an intern in the Social Justice Internship Program, the brainchild of the Reverend Meg Riley, who was named yesterday as one of the new co-moderators of our association. Meg has dozens of mentees and protégés spread out among our association and in our world ministers and leaders of social justice organizations who were trained by her to live into our promise and our passion, to speak out and to amplify other voices. Over the years, the UUA made space for me to explore my faith, my commitments and my desires. Lay leaders and ministers across the country sat through workshops I led when I honestly had no idea what I was doing. They lifted me up though, they nurtured my faith. They were proud of me and kind to me and challenged and taught me too. They supported me as I enrolled in seminary and now over 10 years since I graduated, our association is still helping me pay off the debt I incurred in order to answer my call 
to become a Unitarian Universalist minister and to dedicate my life in service of this faith. As Unitarian Universalists, we are rooted to those who went before us for good and for ill. We are the inheritors of a faith that has wrestled for centuries with the questions of the individual and the collective, with personal freedom and the common good. This morning, just an hour ago, my friend and colleague, the Reverend Joan Javier Duval of our congregation in Montpelier, Vermont, delivered the Sunday service at General Assembly. In the sermon, she wrestled with the complex and messy nature of our Unitarian Universalist heritage, citing our theological and for some biological ties to the pilgrim settlers who originally colonized these lands we now know as the United States. I encourage you to check out and watch the service at the GA website. Go to uua.org GA. Joan said this morning, our individual and collective ancestry is often fraught. The very origins of the Unitarian branch of our religious tree is gnarly. This year, 2020, marks the 400-year anniversary of the founding of the Plymouth Colony, the 400-year anniversary of the occupation of the Wampanoag lands by the Pilgrims of England. Those of us who claim Unitarian Universalism as part of our roots, she says, must grapple with this part of our past which laid a foundation for the construction of this religious tradition. We must grapple with the pain of this past, with the destruction and cruelty that some of our ancestors caused others of our ancestors. Those of us who are white have a particular responsibility to face the demons of this past and the legacy and ongoing reality of white supremacy that runs in our veins. We have a responsibility to heed the call, the invitation, the plea of our siblings in faith, our siblings of color, and all those who claim marginalized communities to hear their stories, to witness their experiences, and to work alongside them for justice and a world reborn. I believe we can do this. I believe we must do this, and I believe we are doing this, however messy it may be. Because this is what I know to be true. When people have followed this faith, truly followed this faith that is built on the beliefs that each of us knows something of the truth and that humanity is fundamentally and ultimately redeemable, lovable, and good, it works on hearts. It transforms lives and institutions. It pushes us, sometimes kicking and screaming, into new spaces and new ways of being that are more loving and more just. As the inheritors of this free faith, we are given wings to fly into our future, a future of our own design. With her powerful words in this morning's reading, the Reverend Kiyama Raman speaks directly to communities of color, descendants of the ancestors upon whose bowed backs this nation profited for centuries and generations and still does today. Did you not know, she says, that just as our ancestors were delivered, that you also would be delivered? You also would be delivered. This deliverance will come, she says, not through human, through human agency. Yes, through human agency, the method by which the holy acts in the world. And through human agency, through our free choice, all are invited to join in the creation of a new legacy, one we will leave for future generations. Our association like our nation, is in the midst of a great awakening, a great turning. We are asking questions and making statements that will define us for generations. We are listening, finally, to voices that have gone unheeded for far too long. We are leaning into our discomfort, searching our hearts, and living into the promise and the practice of our faith. We are examining our roots and stretching our wings. We are answering the call of the ancestors who are calling us into new being in this time and this place. It is an unprecedented time. 
In the midst of this pandemic, it is a time of trial and tribulation, a time of uncertainty and suffering, but also a time of opportunity and possibility. How will we answer the call? Who will we choose to be? How will we live our faith in these uncharted waters? May we be reminded that the collective is strengthened by each of our individual identities and that we as individuals are strengthened by being part of the collective. May we remember that we can do things together, together, that we could never do, never accomplish on our own. And may we remember that the greatest blessing that we offer each other is to support one another in the fullness of our being. May we remember that none of us is alone. A great cloud of witnesses and a wider village sustain us as we venture forth. Now is the time, and this is the place, and we, all of us together, are the ones we have been waiting for.